can you hear me? Or I need to stay in, the, in front of the of the microphone. It's okay. Pascal, maybe you should change the. There's yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. We have another one. Just into it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so thanks for the committee to invite me for the tutorial. So the idea is I will give you some insight about what is tag-based theory, what we can do with that, and uh, then you, probably you will be more able to enjoy the rest of the talks of the day. So uh, here's my outline. I will start with definition. I will give you some usual tag-based bound and historical review. Uh, algorithm uh, derived from uh, back page bound that are interesting, uh, what we call localized priors, and if I have time, I, have time, I will finish with the transactive setting, which is not clear. So are you sure that the micro is on? The, the one... Uh, uh, okay, yes. Okay. Okay, so let's start with definition. Uh, so I, I use the, the basic stand, uh, Usual standard, uh, so x, y are uh, uh, the description and label pair. We are supposing that, uh, except it's stated differently, that uh, all the data is given by an unknown distribution D. Uh, the learning uh, sample are denoted by S. A predictor or uh, a predictor and uh, or an hypothesis is basically a function that start from uh, the uh, description X and try to predict the correct label and, and a learning algorithm is, oh, I will stay there. <laughs> a learning algorithm then is uh, simply uh, an algorithm that takes a, a, a training set and output a, a predictor. But we have a loss function, the usual definition of loss function, the empirical loss is basically the average on the, on the data and the uh, general loss is the expectation of the loss, giving this unknown description, right? Uh, so for, uh, for pack base, we are interested in uh, what we call majority vote classifier. What are they? It's simply the, you, you have a bunch of predictor, and they, they are all have their opinion, then you give some weight to each predictor, and the majority vote simply choose which one, uh, which category uh, has the most uh, important votes. Uh, Here is the simplest case where the votes are either plus one and min or minus one. You have more general setting. That's not a problem. It's important to point out that many learning algorithms output majority vote, even if they are not considered as, as it is. Of course, uh, all the ensemble method are uh, of that way, but you can also see perfecter machine as a majority vote. Uh, and the last layer of uh, neural network has some kind of majority vote. What's, what's Q? What? What's Q? Q? Uh, Q, Q is the, the, the weight that you give to the, to the voters. Okay, so it's, we will call it the posterior. Okay, and so uh, the risk of the majority vote, basically the probability that the majority vote make an error. So it's the probability that most of, more than the half of the, of the voter, given their weight, uh, are misclassified. Uh, okay, and uh, the problem in pack based theory is we are interested in the risk of the majority vote, but it's difficult to, to have a bound on it because it's based on uh, uh, this, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the indicative function, which is not continuous. So we, we try instead of bounding uh, a related uh, classifier that we call the Gibbs classifier. Uh, it's a, classif a stochastic classifier that basically take, for each example, choose according to the distribution Q a voter, and it, it is that voter that will decide. So the risk of the Gibbs classifier basically is the average uh, risk of all the voters, right? And uh, it is well known that there are a relation between the risk of the majority vote and the risk of the Gibbs classifier yeah, by a factor of two. Basically, you can see it many different ways, but one interesting way to see it, it's a uh, direct application of the Markov inequality. And so, uh, and this is interesting because then you can say, well, I'm not happy with this factor of two. 
because uh, two times something that is not good is very bad. So there's a way to, to have a tighter upper bound of the majority vote, given uh, uh, not only the, the Gibbs classifier, but what we call the disagreement also. And it's based on the country championship inequality. So what you have is uh, you can bound the risk bound by basically the um, what we call the C bound that is basically based on uh, the risk of the Gibbs classifier and also the second moment of uh, of the loss function basically. And uh, what you can see here is this is the, the risk of the Gibbs classifier and, uh, and and so you can see that you have. More, more room where you can have a good uh, generalization uh, error for the majority vote. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, because uh, well, here, uh, if it's darker, then the, the risk of the majority vote is, is, is very good. So you see that even if you have risk very, very bad, uh, around 0.4, there are some way to have a risk of majority vote almost zero there. So it's a tighter way to bound the, the, the situation. But I won't go into this uh, today because uh, we'll need more than one hour to talk. Uh, so uh, now some back Bayesian bounds of a bit of prehistory of the, the everything start in 1975. Even if the people who were working on that didn't know a thing about machine learning, it's about uh, variational and, 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 and the other theory. So it, here is the, what we call the Dunsker paradigm inequality. It, it's something that relates some kind of expe uh, an expectation on a distribution P to an expectation on a distribution Q. And it, the, 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 the relation between them is quantified by the Kilbert labor uh, divergence, which is by, de defined as uh, in, in this slide. Mm -hmm. right? And this is the, the most important part of the uh, of the uh, of the back-based approach. It it helps us to transform something that we we have a priori because before seeing the data, we don't have a clue of how to do the majority vote. So we have to define a prior, which is a distribution on the voters that you have to, to decide only by your previous knowledge of the uh, of the problem, not using the data. And then you look at the data, and you say, well, my P is not so good, so I would like to change the weight of the voters in order to have a better, uh, uh, a better performance on, on my data. And you can do that, but there's a, pay to pay, uh, a price to pay, and it is basically uh, the Kelbat library dimensions. Uh, uh, after the prehistory, uh, you have uh, John Schauteller and, and Bob Williamson. John will, will talk this afternoon that uh, were the first to really think about uh, PAC analysis, not probably approximately correct analysis of Bayesian estimator. And after that uh, comes uh, David McAllister that uh, give the first, the, the, the first bound on uh, known as back based bound, and it's basically the following, okay? If you look at it, you have what you, you, you have that first, the, you have a pack bound, so the probability will hold almost all the time. Okay, and what what is the bound is saying is basically saying first that for any distribution Q that you want to find, okay, it, you can the bound is uniformly valid for any majority vote that you will like to to consider. For any majority vote, the difference between the, the, the true generalization error of the Gibbs and uh, what you see on the data is always bounded by basically the difference between what you think a priori of what should be your majority vote and what you decide to be your majority vote and a complexity term that is not so big, basically. Okay? And all the back base bound are basically in, in that form. But in the case of Michael, it's quite easy to, to uh, isolate the, the, the risk, and you can see that uh, you have a convergence uh, on one of our square root of M, which is basically what you, uh, you intend. <coughs> um, a few years after, Seeger and, and then Langford, uh, and in fact, they were discussing together, so I will tell you, I call this bond the Langford-Seeger bond. Uh, 
uh, a relic with a more tight bound, which is based on what we call the uh, um, the small key uh, the small key Kullback Libre divergence is simply the Kullback Libre divergence between Bernoulli distribution, the first one having a probability of success of Q, and the second one having a probability of success of P. And so here is the formula. And so you have a distance again between what you observe on the data and what uh, what you really, really like to, to, to minimize. And it's always depending on how far you have to change what you think a priori and a term, right? So, and here is basically how it works, okay? Supposing that uh, this term is, is 0.6, Okay, and supposing that you empirically observe is 0.1, then you have this Kullback Leber, uh, small Kullback Leber on the distribution that gives you this curve, and you have the, uh, the, the two bounds, which is in trigger and super. And, uh, and I, I will show you basically how it works in general. So, above all the, the, the bound in, in back based theory are basically uh, can be proved up with basically the same ideas. I will show you the, the important step of that and then you will be able to understand that if you want to make some other change to, uh, to your, uh, your pack-based theory then I will show you how you can manage to change basically the step of the proof in order to adapt to different framework. Okay? So the, the, the so the idea is, in general, if you have a, a, a convex function delta, uh, and uh, then you will be able to have this kind of uh, pack-based bound, meaning that the distance co corresponding to delta between what you observe uh, and what is the true uh, generalization error of the Gibbs risk is always bounded by uh, the Gilbert Leibler plus some uh, complexity term. In general, the complexity term is basically the sum of all the binomial times uh, and exponential, and, and you have to make some supremum uh, on all the possible risks that you can uh, observe. So, how, how it works? Uh, I, I tell you the first step is the change of measure inequality, that uh, the downturn uh, paradigm uh, inequality. So, this is an important. Uh, uh, stone for, uh, for, for the proof, but you also need to have a, a pack, a probability approximately correct uh, bound, so you need some kind of uh, inequality, here we will make use of Markov inequality, but we can think about using other type of inequality, and also the, the, uh, uh, this is not necessarily because you can have other uh, inequality concentration, but here I will use the idea that uh, the empirical risk on a finite set uh, of n element can only take n plus one values. Okay, so the empirical loss in general. Okay, and so how do you prove the, the theorem? So you start from the, the left side of the, of the inequality and then you say delta is supposed to be convex. So I can use gentian inequality uh, to get the expectation outside of the function. Of course, we have a, uh, an inequality here. Then you use dots cover them, or any change of measure inequality that make your KL appear. At, the, at that moment, there, this is always true. There is there's no probability here. Whereas the back uh, bound appearing is when we make use of Markov inequality. And, and then uh, what you do is the fact that the prior has been seen before seeing the data means that you can swap the two expectations on certain measurability conditions I won't talk about. And uh, then you, you, you think about the fact that there is uh, uh, only n plus one possible value for the, for the expected uh, empirical, uh, for the empirical loss. And so you, you, you make some stratification of that. And then you say, well, the worst case is when, uh, among all the possible risks, I will take the worst case, and it is the, the, the end of the proof, right? Yes? Can, can you please just uh, give the reference for this? I can send you my slide if you want. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, the reference is uh, the thesis of uh, Pascal and uh, some other paper. Uh, yeah, I think it's the first time that we have this. But I will be pleased to send you my slide if you want. So when you apply the Jensen inequality, do you assume convexity in both the arguments from here? See? <coughs> uh, when you apply the Jensen inequality, do you assume that um, the function delta is convex in both the arguments? Exactly. That's why you can... Yeah. So it's convex on, on both. Yeah, it has to be. Can you repeat the question before it's uh, Okay, so the question was, uh, uh, if my assumption about delta is to be convex on both uh, argument, not only on one, uh, one at a time, right? Otherwise, this was the big proof, right? Okay, and uh, so what we have then, if you, you can then simply have, uh, recover the langford seeger the theorem, Simply, you have to say the delta uh, function is the small kl, and you can retrieve uh, McAllister uh, simply by saying that the delta function is 2 times q minus p to the square. You can retrieve uh, the Catani bound. I suppose Catani will present it a bit. But I will have a chance to present it. Uh, simply by taking, this is an interesting one. It's, the idea is the following. You, you, you want to have something convex, but that is linear on Q. And you want to have a 1 here. And so you make a bit of calculation, and then this is the nice function that you, you obtain, which is convex, okay, and which gives you uh, this Catani bound. Also, the Catani bound is very interesting because it's the, it's the first one that is has a convergence rate of 1 over n. But it's not exactly true, because there are some kind of bias here. Okay, and, and, and but you can control the bias if you can take a very small C and thing like that. But nevertheless, it's interesting. And, and Olivier has some interesting result also in statistics using back base theory in order to say that we can manage to have a uh, fast rate. Are you going to talk about that this afternoon? No, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and also we have the the bound of Alki et al. Uh, that is, uh, I won't get into, but we can also retrieve by our bound. Uh, and just just to say, well, okay, I say that you just have for the Seeger bound, you just have to use the small KL. Why this is so, and why do you have the two square root of n in red uh, instead of this supremum of over r of blah 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 and, and blah blah blah? The idea is. Uh, you, you, can, you can manage to, to make some uh, easy calculation out of that. You simply say that, okay, this is the KL function, so you, you, you replace delta by KL, you make some uh, mathematical manipulation. You again, you say, well, the empirical risk has only a, a, a m plus one possibility if the size of the, the training set is m, and so then you remove the other problem with the empirical risk. You are, uh, you are stuck with the, 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 the true risk here, but, but, uh, but what you can see here is uh, this, uh, uh, the empirical risk uh, follow a binomial law. So if you, you expand this binomial law, what you will have, if you will see in, the, in this, you will make, you appear a uh, risk to the k, and um, one minus three to the m minus k that will cancel with those two one, and so everything cancel out, and you are uh, obtaining something that is don't don't have to consider it, neither the risk nor the empirical risk. Uh, but it's not so so beautiful. So you 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 look at uh, more of a dilemma and you can <coughs> make it much more small, uh, interesting basically. Okay, and uh, of course. This is only true for IID situation, so otherwise the empirical risk do not follow the binomial law, so you cannot do that. But the general theorem, nevertheless, is always true. The only problem is you have to deal with the calculation of this complex, the, uh, the I of uh, delta of M. That can be extremely awful if you are far from the IID situation. Okay. Now. So a bit of history, I start the prehistory of uh, that uh, 
the Duncan paradigm, then I talk, talk about the, the Williamson and Schottler fact analysis of Bayesian estimator. I tell you something about the McAllister bound, and I tell you something about the uh, Seeger Langford bound. So I will try to f rapidly make an overview, a uh, partial overview of what happened in, in this field. And, and so you will have all the reference if you want to, to look at it after that. So in supervised learning, for example, there's a lot of application to linear classifier and in, and in particular to S super vector machine. I will uh, tell you something about it uh, later on in the presentation. There's a lot of things about theory. Of course, uh, the Catoni is one of the, the most uh, important uh, paper to read, but it's a bit difficult. Maybe you should not start with it. But there's a lot of interesting things. But you have also Mir and Zhang. Uh, McAllister in 2013 has something that uh, a pack based approach that explains dropout. Uh, German et al. Uh, at, uh, for example, 2016 has an interesting paper with Francis and uh, Simon Lacoste Julien, I think, uh, talking about uh, the, the, the link that is. Uh, that pack based allows us to, to go from frequencies approach to a Bayesian approach. So it's some kind of a bridge between those two realities that are not talking to each other too much. Also, you have Ben London, uh, whose poster is exactly there, that, that has a, a, a poster in, in NIPS this year, that gives some uh, interesting bound about uh, anything that you can do with uh, stochastic gradient descent, especially, I suppose, deep learning. Always talk about these days. Um, also, you have this interesting thing that if you have a bound, you can try to minimize it or to minimize the surrogate of it, and then you you can construct many different algorithms that will you you know that will have some nice property because they will be deleted. They, they will not be more. Uh, they, they will have some guarantee due to the bound. And uh, we also have a back based theory and regression. Uh, Stochastic learning, uh, if I have time, I will give you some example about that. But also domain adaptation. Domain adaptation is, is something that is quite difficult to, to handle. So uh, what we do with uh, Germain and, uh, and others, we, we try first to make a pack-based bound and then try to minimize it. And so we, we can organize what we should be in, in some such a situation. But you also have pack based on non IIE data. Um, this is more difficult because then you can you cannot do the, the usual thing. But there are some concentration inequality, namely Asuma Efting, and some generalization out of that that can help you to deal with this ugly term that is I of uh, subscript delta that I just showed you. Uh, of course, non IID data inco uh, includes uh, use statistic of higher order, so it, it's quite interesting to be able to have such a bound. And uh, last uh, uh, situation that I want to point out is the sample compression setting, is the situation when the, the voters uh, are defined on the data. So the voters are defined using the, uh, the, uh, the information contained in the training set. This is quite tricky because you cannot have a prior on something that you cannot have seen yet. But there's a way to do that and you make a prior on all the possible way of constructing your voters and stuff like that and you can have the, this uh, interesting sample compression setting that it can be uh, analyzed through backbase. So this is for a supervised learning, uh, density estimation also, we have an interesting result about that. Uh, uh, Martingale, uh, reinforcement learning, oh I forgot uh, for reinforcement learning is uh, Joël Pinot et al, like that, uh, uh, oh it's there, okay, far there uh, Joël and Pinot, that do something in the reinforcement learning. And uh, there's a lot of other results, so uh, I apologize for, for people who are not in, in, in this slide. Okay, uh, rapidly, what can we do with algorithm derived from pack based bound? Okay, so here is the Olivier Catonis bound. Okay, I, I showed you before. And what you can see minimizing this bound is minimizing a trade off between a certain constant to be defined uh, between uh, your empirical risk and 
the, the value of the Kilba fiber. So you have a trade-off here. Okay, and, and, and then so minimizing the bound is minimizing this trade -off. So it's, it's quite obvious that it's something that should be interesting to do. And of course, C will become an hyperparameter of your algorithm since you cannot really decide which is the best C for the, for, depending on the data on which you, you will do it. And what is interesting is if you restrict your prior and your posterior to be Gaussian, isotropic Gaussian, then you end up with exactly the set covering, uh, the support vector machine algorithm. So you rediscover SVM using that. In fact, it's not exactly SVM. You have to replace the inch loss by the sigma ideal loss. But otherwise, it's about the same algorithm. So pack base justify, give it another certification to uh, what uh, to do this nice uh, algorithm that is SVM. But this is not only uh, with SVM that we can uh, have that. You have a pack-based bound minimizer that can give you adabost. In fact, it's adabost regularized, and it's not L2 regularized, neither L1 regularized. It's KL regularized, which is exactly something in between. And so the theory says that you should regularize adabost, but with the KL. Uh, you can have kernel rate regression. You have also uh, a structural output algorithm, the one of Cortes and Mori, for example, is, is exactly the minima uh, bound minimizer of a, a pack-based bound on structural output, of course. But we also found a lot of new algorithms uh, simply by defining new pack-based bound and trying to minimize it. Of course, if you are in the IID case, in the classification case, you only retrieve something that has already been found because there's a lot of people who did a lot of work on that. But if you go in other frameworks that are more difficult, this is the first way to go and to see what you should do. You try to find a pack-based bound and then you, you, you minimize it as a your algorithm. Okay, localize prior now. Um, okay, uh, if you look at this, uh, you can see that the bound can be very awful if the KL is very, very big. Okay? So, suppose that you, you, your, you, your, your prior is very bad and then you, 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 are, uh, you are forced in order to have good uh, uh, empirical performance to really choose a cube that is very far from it, then the bound can be uh, very, very, very big. Okay? So, you, the, the bound says that you have to make a trade-off between empirical accuracy and complexity, the, the complexity being represented by the KL. Uh, so, uh, if you want to have a good generalization, okay? But uh, there's a luckiness argument here. So, it can happen that you cannot find a Q that can achieve the trade-off in, in, in a way that you are satisfied. So the question of a uh, localized prior is, uh, um, can, can we have some guarantee that uh, 30 minutes, okay, not second, okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we, 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 uh, so we have some kind of a luckiness argument here, okay, uh, and so we would like to have, is there some possibility to have some guarantee that even if we are not really lucky, then the, the bound will never be very, very big. Okay, I remember you that the KL can even be infinite, which is a very bad bound. Uh, 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 so, um, uh, that's exactly what I say. So, one way to do that is to be sure that the prior is not bad. So, you can reserve a part of your, uh, of your training data in order to learn the prior. And it, it does not have to be so big because you, you, you don't want to have the best prior, you just want to have a prior that's not so bad. And then, if, if you do that, of course, you will improve your chance to have a good guarantees, right? But another way to, to do that is to make a prior that is distribution dependent. Uh, I, I recall you that the prior cannot be data dependent but it can be distribution dependent, okay? But the distribution is unknown. So if you do that, the, your prior will be unknown, okay?
Okay? But this is not actually really a problem because you don't need to know the prior P. You just need to estimate the Kilbat library divisions between this prior and your posterior Q. Okay, so, so this is a way to do that. Okay? Uh, we have a uh, Shatiranda et al. that has proposed this. So they, they say, well, well, I, I, I'm, I'm working on Gaussian and I will try to find the Gaussian that uh, will be in the center of the data, basically, which is a good idea. But where is the center of the data? You don't know it because you don't know the distribution, but when you observe the, the data, you, you can uh, estimate where is the center and you can bound the error that you are making. Olivier Catani has a lot of uh, ideas like that. Uh, yeah, in fact, it's the first one who really get into the, those ideas. We have also, uh, with uh, Guy Lever and John Chatero, I have some kind of result about that. I will just show you a bit. So what we decide is you, we take the prior, the following prior, which is, which is a good idea of prior. Okay, uh, I say, well, I will put more weight on, uh, on voters that are good. That, which is very good, a good prior. Of course, I, I don't know the distribution, so I don't know the risk, so I don't know the prior. Okay? But this is my prior. Okay? And what we prove uh, is if you take the posterior, the following posterior, which is I will try to put more weight on classify, on voters that are good in my data. This Q, I can, I can calculate it. Okay? Uh, and, and then, uh, so can I? Can I have a, a possibility of calculating the, the, the Kilbat library between this P particular and this Q particular? And of course, the, the answer is yes. And what is the idea? We apply a second <coughs> base bound. This time, basically, it, it's a back base bound uh, that will bound the Kilbat library divisions between the specific P that we don't know and the, the specific Q that I showed you. Right? And this is basically the. So here you have some time that you, you know that if you have enough example, you will not have, your your uh, true risk will not be so far away from your empirical risk, right? Because you, you don't have the key last like dimensions. Another way to uh, to um, to do uh, localized primes is simply to make the KL disappear, saying I don't need it anymore. I put it in the basket and I, I throw it away. So this is a bit of magic. Uh, I'm not sure I totally understand why it works, uh, but the, the proof is there. Okay. So the idea is to consider auto-complemented voters. Okay. So if you have a voters in your in, in, in your set, you have a voters that is thinking exactly the opposite, and the, we will say that the posterior Q is aligned on P. Okay, if basically the sum of the, the two, uh, the two uh, auto-complemented uh, voters according to Q is the same as the one according to P. Okay, for example, is if you have exactly Q gap is equal to P is equal to the uniform, it's, it's working. But, so this is a, a, a big constraint. So this, for example, if you have two M voters, means that each voter cannot go too far from, from P. For if P is the uniform, then the voters cannot have more than a weight of uh, 1 over M. And, uh, okay, because the, the average will be a 1 over 2 M. So it, this is, this is a, a quite good constraint, but it's not so bad because except for a very weird case where H is uncountable, you can always find uh, a posterior that is uh, aligned that gives exactly the same measure to the vote of any posterior. So you, you, you give your posterior, it is not aligned on P, I can manage to transform it into a new posterior Q prime that will be aligned on P. So for which I will have this nice property. Okay? And when you do that, magic appear, the KL simply disappear. Wait, yes? So, sorry, what, what's BQ? BQ is the majority vote. Okay, uh, according, you put Q, Q is a distribution on, on the voters, and so it's a majority vote, but weighted by Q. Okay. Uh, so here's the theorem. Again, it's exactly the same, uh, the same structure that I showed you for the general theorem. 
the, the same way, you, you do exactly the same thing, except that you change your change of measure inequality. The, the change of measure inequality that I, I, I will use, uh, I will uh, show you in the next slide. But for the rest, it's exactly the same proof. It's exactly the same step. I'm just changing the change of measure inequality. Right? Of course, why, why this change of measure inequality works? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's not always true, basic, basically. It, it's true for the, the uh, when delta is equal to the small KL, and it's true also when uh, you have the McAllister delta, so 2 times Q minus P to the square. It's not true for the Cantonese bound, for example. Okay, you have to have delta has to have some kind of property. But for, for the two most important uh, delta, it works. Here I will show you. Uh, uh, basically, the idea of the proof okay, for uh, for the situation where we are supposing that we are doing with delta e is equal to the McAllister one. Okay, and so you see, you, there's a lot of different way to do that. You separate H your set of order into two set, the the, the, the one that think uh, in, in one direction and they are complement. If uh, it's an uh, uncountable set, you have to take care about measurability and things like that. But I won't get into the detail. Uh, and then what you do is you take uh, your, your expectation, uh, uh, which will give you your, uh, uh, here. so you have this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, expectation. And so what you, what you want to do is to transform it a bit, ah, oh, there's a mistake here. Uh, no, it's okay. No, there's a mistake. This is a P and this is a Q. Uh, but this is the, the idea. Well, so I want to transform the expectation on P simply on the expectation on Q without having to pay the KL uh, Cobalt Library divergence. And the idea is the following. It's really, so you separate so your classifier between the, the one and their complement. And so you, what you take is you, your, your expectation is the integral over, uh, over the first set of class and plus the integral over the second set of class. Of course, you have to take care about miserability, but the idea is there. Okay? And then what you, you do is the following. You realize that if you change uh, h by minus h uh, everywhere, okay, uh, then, then you, it, you, your integral is on this h1. Okay? But what happened to the risk? But the, the risk of minus h is minus one minus the risk of h. And it's exactly the same for the, the true risk. Okay, so, and you know that one minus one simplify, and you know that, so you, you, what you have, you have true risk minus empirical risk. But since you have a square, you can change it, okay? Yes? What, why is that, that uh, the risk of minus h is one minus the risk of h? Because uh, they are auto complement. It minus h, think exactly the contrary of h. Okay. Uh, we are in the binary case where the voters can vote plus one or minus one only. So if you don't think minus, you think minus h. Okay. Good question. Uh, and so then uh, you join your two, uh, your two integral, okay? And you know that you are in, in a situation where uh, it is uh, aligned. So the sum uh, on, on, on on P is equal to the sum on Q. And then you do exactly the same step but background and you obtain what you want. So the change of measure inequality is, uh, is free in the case where we are in aligned posterior. Right? So that's why you obtain basically the, 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 the trick of free. I have to point out that you, for the Gibbs, this is not really good. Since all the voters has, uh, 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 must be very close to the prior, you, you, the, the risk of the true Gibbs can be very bad if you have a lot of bad voters. Because if you have uh, bad voters, their complement is also bad, even worse. Okay? And you have to, the best thing to, you can do is to give all the way to, to the less bad one, right? So. So for the Gibbs risk itself, it's not really something that will give you a bound that is interesting. It will be a, a tight bound, meaning that the difference between the 
empirical residential risk will be close, but it will not be a good bound, they basically, because he empirically the Gibbs risk will be bad. Then you can make, think about what I said at the beginning of the talk, and saying, well, instead of using the, 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 the Markov inequality to have this factor of two between the majority vote and the, 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 the Gibbs risk, you can try to make intervene what is what I call the second moment or the uh, disagreement uh, expectation uh, between voters, and you have another kind of pack based approach that you can do and things like that. Okay. Yes? Sorry, uh, so I have a question about those aligned posteriors. Yeah. Would you have a constructive heuristics of such posteriors? Because I'm failing to see if, if I take any, any posterior, I'm able to make it aligned with respect to It's very line. easy. Uh, it's very easy. It's, uh, it's uh, high school math. But uh, how would you do it? I mean, for example, if I take a posterior which is exponential minus the empirical risk, would it be always aligned with the corresponding prior? I mean, wouldn't you have in, in fact, what, what, we oh, choose, right. choose the posterior that you want. Don't okay. care about being aligned. And I will show you how to align it. Okay. okay. Basically, what you do is you, you, you give. Uh, the, 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 one, the, 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 the voters that you don't want, you give them uh, 1 over n weight and 1 over n weight. And so they, they can't sell each other because they are opposite, they are complement. Okay? And, then, and then so you, you, can, you can manage to, 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 to play with the weights. The problem that will give is an aligned posterior. If you have bad uh, voters, you will end up that those voters will be bad uh, in the average. So the Gibbs risk will not be good, but the majority vote risk can be good. And so we have some uh, proof of uh, uh, theoretical and empirical proof that we can do that. And uh, so one of our algorithms, MinCQ, is exactly that. We are working with this uh, align for Sega stuff, and we have a, a, a simple method that beats basically uh, SVM on many, many, many uh, benchmarks. Like and this and so on. So there is something there. It's not totally understood, in, in, even by me. But I think it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Does it uh, go through, go through the continuous case? Yes, it go to the continuous case. But there are some kind of exception. In the continuous case, you cannot always assume that uh, any posterior Q can be re reweight in the uh, equivalent. Aligned posterior Q prime. They are uh, a mild condition, but it's not a big, big con condition. Yes. Is there some price to pay for the alignment? Yeah, I tell you that the Gibbs risk will be bad because you have to give weight according to your prior to everybody. And if a posterior you you find out that those guys are bad, they, you are, so if, if H is bad, minus H will be even worse. And you have to give to them basically the, 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 the weight that you should give a, a priori. So for the Gibbs risk, you can end up with a very bad Gibbs risk empirically. So that, that's, the, that's the, 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 the reason why it's not, uh, it's not uh, a miracle. For the majority vote, you, most of the time you, you have a very nice majority vote, meaning that it will be. Uh, very small, but uh, but you don't have the guarantee through the pack based bond and the Gibbs risk because the Gibbs risk is bad, and twice something bad is very very bad, right? But you can do it by the C bound that I showed you in, at the beginning of my talk, and you you have some kind of better uh, possibility of generalization there. Okay, so I have time for a transactive. So what is the transactive setting? Like in the, in the, the, the IID setting is simple. You have modern nature that gives you some example according to our distribution that she I is the only one to know it, D. Okay? And they give you your, your training set in this way. In the transactive net, uh, setting, there is no intervention of any gods at all. You have a lot of data, okay? S plus U. you. And so you take at random some kind, so some part of, uh, of, of your data, so let's say S, you ask to a human person to make the label 
out of those examples, and you want to infer to the unlabeled part that has been, been seen by your, uh, your human being to, to, to be labeled by your algorithm, right? And so, this is important in probability, you always have to define what is your, uh, your stochastic experiment. Here, the stochastic experiment is the action of choosing a subset of a big set of unlabeled data and label it, right? In uh, IID situation, the, ex the, 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 the experiment consists of asking to modern nature, nature to give you your training set, right? And if, if, you, when, if you have a pack-based bound or a pack bound in general, that means that your probability is 1 minus delta over a, a, a lot of different uh, redoing of this, this process. So the guarantee in, in transactive setting is the guarantee that if I start again with unlabeled data Z, that will not change. Z is the universe. Okay, but I ask for human people to label a different subset S, then in the protocol I should end up basically most of the time with the, what the bound will tell me with probability 1 minus delta. Okay, uh, and so here is the bound, okay? So again, you have a delta that is, uh, that should be um, uh, convex. And uh, then you, you have exactly the same structure of bound, except that the complexity term, the, 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 the T uh, uh, on delta, is a bit more complicated, right? But it's a bit more complicated, but it's, a, a finite sum, so it can be calculated. And how how can we prove it? But again, it's exactly the same uh, the same uh, pattern that you have. You start with your delta, you take the Jensen inequality, you take the change of measure, uh, you take Markov inequality, you take the the fact that uh, the prior doesn't see the data, so you can swap, and then you have this uh, idea that well, now the empirical risk in this setting is not following a binomial law, it's following a hypergeometric law. So then I have to use the hypergeometric uh, uh, development, and this is why it's more ugly than in the IID term. It's okay. And what you can see also is, uh, for example, people don't like uh, KL divergence, for example, but then you have to change your change of measure. And there is a way to do that. You can. There's a pack-based theory that can allows you to do stuff with uh, really divergence, for example, and things like that. You have a lot of possibility, and basically, it's always you you want when you want to play, you play with one of those uh, six uh, steps. Okay, so uh, I, I I will stop here. Say, uh, say thanks to Mario Basha, my my uh, forever colleague in pack-based theory. Thanks also for uh, the Graal team especially uh, Pascal, the former graph thing that gave me a lot of uh, those slides. <laughs> and also thanks to John, uh, Liva, David, uh, Guy, uh, Evgeny, Ilya, John for a very nice uh, talk uh, during those years. And here are, are what you have to read if you like the packets. I'm not trying to find the model. I, 
this is a precancerous approach. Mm -hmm. I want to find a classifier that is of the form of the majority vote. This is the first step. So in the frequencies, more uh, ideas, you have to, uh, you can say, I, I don't want to make any a priori uh, decision and I can have a bound that is <coughs> basically a flat bound. So for example, the can razor uh, approach. So you can have such, such a thing. Because the idea is, if you have, uh, the problem is you, have, you want to have a training set bound. A training set bound must be valid for any possible outcome if, a priori before seeing the data, right? So basically what you do is uh, you, you try you, your favorite tra testing set bound, for example, uh, uh, approximation by a normal or thing like that. And so you, you, what you try to do is you, if you try one classify, one uh, outcome, one majority vote on your test set, then you will have a probability of, of, a, of one minus delta of failing. But because of the union bound, if you go uh, to the, um, if you want to test two possible uh, majority votes on the same testing set, to have an overall probability of one minus delta of not failing, each one has to be to have a probability of one minus delta over two, for example, right? But what you can do if you can say, I have two, two, two classifier to check, okay? But I really think that the first one is the one that I want. And I will just check the second one just to be sure. So what you can do is you can say, well, I, will, I want to have a guarantee of one minus two-third delta for the one that I, on which I believe, and one over one-third delta on the one which I believe less. And if I'm lucky, I will find out that the first one is the one that I want to keep and I will have a better guarantee because uh, it, it, the, the 1 minus 2 delta will be something that it will be better. It's about the same idea that is using here. And so the idea is we believe that if we are close to the, if Q is equal to P, it's basically a testing set bound. Okay, based on uh, special uh, concentration in inequality. But what you think is, well, I will stratify the penalty according to some kind of measure. And the measure is the Kilbert Lagrange divergence, basically. And why we use the Kilbert Lagrange divergence? It's because of the Dunn's curve Aranon inequality that we, we have in hand. But there are other inequality on which you have a different uh, way. But it's always the same thing. The complexity in the back base approach is given as how far you are from what you were taking a theory. That's why it's so close to the Bayesian approach. Do I uh, Yeah? <laughs> yes? So I was wondering, um, so the, the concentration inequalities you showed are for the, the empirical risk, so that's a, a mean of a random variable. So in uh, the book by Pascal Massard and the Bossi Boucheron, they look at other functions of IID random variables. You can take their techniques for the. Uh, you can just plug that into the back Bayesian approach, and it will, you know, it combines perfectly. But has anyone investigated that? Do you get? You know, uh, I think Olivier did something about that. Ask uh, do Pierre think he did something about that, or slightly related? Slightly related. So, back Bayesian telegrams inequality. Uh, yeah. And also, there are some. Uh, Evgeny did something with uh, Bernstein inequality, uh, try to, to get more tight bounds and things like that. Yes, there's some kind of uh, work on that direction. But yeah, I, I will look at uh, telegram inequality. Uh, maybe it's a good idea. Good majority vote. Okay, and 
as good performance on the data that you have observed. But if you, you choose a, a queue that is too specific of your, on your data, then you, you will have a very bad KL divergence between your prior and your posterior, and you will pay the price for the generalization value. So this is, a, the, the, the fact is that there's, there's a trade-off. You want to be good on your data, okay, you can, but it, it, it's a price if your posterior is too far from your prior. If you have a good prior, you are lucky, you can have a, a posterior that is very close to it. And then you will have a very good generalization but But if your prior is, is stuck, it's very bad, then you will you will not be able to have good generalization if you really want to have a good classifier at the end. Okay, so there is no base rule between posterior and there, the base rule is not used here. Okay. okay, but it's not exactly true because they are there is a, a paper I I, I might uh, of uh, Francis Bach, uh, Pascal Germain, and uh, Simon Lacroix Julien, that try to, to explain what are a similarity between back base and lesion. Because there are, okay? But at the beginning, back, back base is a frequency approach. But with Bayesian ideas, right? So, so the maximum likelihood you can retrieve it and so, anything like that if you, you put your back base approach in, in, in a correct way. We have to move to the next speaker. Thanks again, Crosswell.